afternoon on this Friday, August 15th. I'm Yimna Naufal. These are today's headlines. Mary Knight Patriarch Shadarai says the army alone protects Lebanon against its challenges, hailing its recent sacrifices that helped defeat the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. A fragile ceasefire around Gaza holds for a second day as Israel's relations with its U.S. ally shows new signs of strain, with tough talks looming on a more lasting peace. After eight years in office, Iraq's Prime Minister says he is stepping down, ending a political deadlock that has plunged his country into uncertainty. Mary Knight Patriarch Shadadai declared that the army alone protects Lebanon against challenges, hailing its recent sacrifices that helped defeat the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, as well as other extremist groups. He added he hopes politicians would follow the example of the army and make the sacrifices necessary to elect a new president. He made the remarks during a mass held in honor of the army martyrs on the occasion of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, known as Eid al Rai said he saluted the army chief general, Jean Ahwaje, the soldiers and security forces with hope for a safe return of the captives held by the Islamist gunmen. He also thanked international initiatives aimed at supporting the army and made his comment in reference to Saudi Arabia's grant of about $1 billion to the army aimed at helping it counter terrorism. Prime Minister Tamam Salam is expressing relief over the ministerial discussions a day before, praising the efforts exerted by ministers to resolve vital issues. He says he is relieved over the serious discussions that lasted seven hours during the cabinet session and comments published in Al Liwa newspaper. He pointed out that important decrees were endorsed, in particular the latest Saudi grant to Lebanese security apparatuses. During a cabinet meeting at the Grand Sarai, the government approved a $1 billion Saudi aid to enable security forces to counter terrorism. Former Prime Minister and the head of the future movement, Saad Hadidi, announced last week that Saudi Arabia did decide to support the military institution with the billion dollar grant following the deadly clashes between troops and extremists in the border town of Arsil. The Internal Security Forces Intelligence Branch has taken control over a Twitter account of the so-called Free Sunnis of Baalbek Brigade, and they uploaded a picture of the Lebanese flag on its header. The move comes a day after ISF announced the arrest of the operator of the Obscure Group's Twitter account. You can see the images on our channel right now. The Lebanese flag was uploaded as the profile picture and the header of the account. The Intelligence Branch detained H. CH, the tweet said, adding that he confessed that he is the owner of the Free Sydney's of Baalbek Brigade's Twitter account. News of his arrest broke out on Thursday evening after the ISF tweeted the matter from its own account. According to the tweet, he is a Lebanese national and he confessed to managing the shadowy group's account. And the group has threatened in the past to target Interior Minister Nuhad Mashnu, Army Chief General Jean Ahwaje, and Magistral Suzanne Al Hajj, Chief of the Internal Security Forces, Cybercrime and Intellectual Property Protection Bureau. A fragile ceasefire around Gaza held for a second day as Israel's relations with its U.S. ally showed no signs of strains with tough talks looming on a more lasting peace. Washington denied a report that the White House was tightening the reins on the routine delivery of military aid to Israel over concerns about the proportionality of its military action in Gaza. But the State Department acknowledged that armed shipments were being kept under review in the face of a conflict that has killed 1,900 Palestinians and 67 people on the Israeli side since July the 8th. Egyptian mediators won a new five-day ceasefire late on Wednesday to give Israeli and Palestinian negotiators more time to thrash out a longer-term truce. The ceasefire got off to a rocky start in its first few hours, but Israeli officials said it had held into a second day on Friday. The military said there are no Palestinian rocket fire that were sent overnight and that it had carried out no airstrikes. And after Eight years in office, Iraq's prime minister announced he was stepping down, ending a political deadlock that has plunged his country into uncertainty as it fights a Sunni militant insurgency. Yasnuri Maliki named a fellow Dawa party member Haider al Abadi as the country's new prime minister. Maliki has been struggling for weeks to stay on for a third four-year term as prime minister amid an attempt by opponents to push him out. 
They accuse him of monopolizing power and pursuing a fiercely pro-Shia agenda that has alienated the Sunni minority. Al Maliki had grown increasingly isolated as he was deserted not only by his Shia allies but also by Iran, the United States, and the UN backed Al Abadi, who has 30 days to put together a cabinet for parliament's approval. Al Maliki came into the political limelight back in 2006 when then president of Iraq, Jalal Talabani, asked him to form Iraq's first full term government since the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Coming up next, Robin Williams was struggling with the early stages of Parkinson's disease, according to his widow. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. U.S. State Department spokeswoman Mehdi Harf addressed the ongoing crisis in Iraq, echoing President Barack Obama's statements earlier in the day that U.S. airstrikes in northern Iraq and humanitarian aid drops to Yazidi refugees have helped many flee to safer areas. Meanwhile, on Thursday, also a Russian aid convoy of more than 200 trucks pushed up to the border, but then stopped, poised to cross into rebel-held territory. The Ukrainian government threatened to use all means available to block the convoy if the Red Cross was not allowed to inspect the cargo. Comments from the White House. We would break the siege of Mount Sinjar and indeed have broken the ISIL siege of that mountain, have saved, helped save many innocent lives uh, at the same time. Our assessment team completed its work, found that our food and water had been reaching people trapped there successfully. Uh, we successfully struck ISIL targets, which allowed people to leave. The Kurdish forces and Yazidis have been working together to lead the evacuation of people from that mountain. A majority of the U.S. military personnel who were part of that assessment team will be departing Iraq in the coming days, as the President said. Uh, and of course, there does remain a major humanitarian and security challenges here. We are working with our international partners and the interna international community uh, to continue uh, fighting both of those threats. Forward here, the President will continue looking at the situation on the ground. He will continue making decisions based on what's our national security interest. But at the same time, really helping the Iraqis get back on their feet and fight. And I would take issue with a little bit of what you said, that the Iraqis have been able to actually regroup in some ways. They've gotten more arms, they've gotten more weapons, and they've been able to start pushing back against ISIL, uh, particularly working with the Kurds to do that. So uh, I think they're they're on the right trajectory here. We just need to help some more, and, and I think they need a little more time. But UN Humanitarian Chief Valerie Amos is to visit Iran for two days of talks on expanding humanitarian cooperation amid a mounting thaw between Tehran and the West. The visit will also be an opportunity to draw attention to Iran's considerable experience and expertise in disaster management and humanitarian response and encourage Iranian engagement in the debate about the future of the humanitarian system ahead of the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. This is according to UN statement. Iran has faced a number of natural disasters in recent years, particularly deadly earthquakes as it stands on several seismic fault lines. A massive quake struck the southern city of Bam in December of 2003, killing 26,000 people and destroying its ancient mud-built citadel. Amos is expected to hold a news conference on Sunday. Staff of the World Health Organization battling an Ebola outbreak in West Africa see evidence the numbers of reported cases and death vastly underestimate the scale of the outbreak, according to the UN agency and its website. The death toll from the world's worst outbreak of Ebola stood on Wednesday at 1,069 from 1,975 confirmed probable and suspected cases. The majority are from Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, while four people have died in Nigeria. The agency's apparent acknowledgement the situation is worse than previously thought could spur governments and aid organizations to take stronger measures against the virus. International agencies are looking into emergency food drops and truck convoys to reach hungry people in Liberia and Sierra Leone, cordoned off from the outside world to halt the spread of the virus, according to a top World Bank official. Tension soars in the Pakistani city of Gujanwala after Pakistani opposition leader Imran Khan's party said gunshots were fired at his vehicle as he led the anti-government march to the capital. Khan was not injured in Friday's attack, but his vehicle was hit. The convoy, which was not bulletproof, was also pelted with stones as the police watched without intervening. Television pictures showed local people tearing up posters featuring Khan's party, Pakistan, Tehreek and Saf, and clashing with his supporters. Khan and religious leader Tahir al-Qadri were both leading separate protest marches from Lahore to Islamabad. 
until they intend to hold a sit-in where Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif resigns. Security was tight in the capital and authorities had blocked several main roads with shipping containers and barbed wire in an effort to thwart the marches. Thousands of people across the country attended protest vigils for an unarmed black Missouri teenager fatally shot by a white police officer and other victims who organizers say died as a result of police brutality. The vigils on Thursday, observed in more than 90 cities as part of a national moment of silence, came days after the shooting death of 18-year-old Michael Brown and the death of a New York man caused by a police officer's chokehold. In central St. Louis, in a tiny park near the Gateway Arch, several hundred people, seemingly an equal number of whites and blacks, gathered in Brown's memory. The site is a short drive from suburban Ferguson, where Brown was killed, stoking racial unrest. In Ferguson, two-thirds of the 21,000 residents are black, and all but three of the 53 police officers are white. The St. Louis gathering was peaceful in contrast with a night of looting and clashes between demonstrators and police in Ferguson earlier in the week. Robin Williams was sober but was struggling with depression, anxiety and the early stages of Parkinson's disease when he died, his widow said. The diagnosis of the progressive illness was an additional fear and burden in his life. Williams was pronounced dead at his home in California on Monday, according to the Sheriff's Office in Marin County, north of San Francisco. A preliminary investigation shows the cause of death to be a suicide due to asphyxia. He is the latest in a line of actors, writers or comics who have declared they have depression. According to Professor Tony Clear, Professor of Psychopharmacology and Affective Disorders at the Institute of Psychiatrist, there have been several, mostly Scandinavian studies, looking at whether there is a link between creative genius and depression. The causes of depression vary between individuals. Very often, they occur after a particular stressful event in our lives, such as losing a job or having relationship problems or becoming unwell in some way, physically unwell. Um, we know that for some people depression runs in the family. We think there might be an inherited vulnerability to depression. Um, heavy drinking can also cause depression. Alcohol is a very good drug in the long term for making people depressed if someone drinks heavily for long periods. We do know that the majority of people with mental health problems and with depression will not commit suicide, but it is the commonest depression is the commonest mental health problem that does arise in people who do kill themselves. Probably over 90% of people who die by suicide also have problems with depression. There's long been a thought, even going back to ancient Greek times, that people with mental health problems may be more creative in all sorts of ways. Um, some research has shown that people with a condition like bipolar disorder, bipolar affective disorder, or schizophrenia, do tend, are more likely, to have jobs in creative professions such as the arts or scientific research. Um, but it's not always inevitable that someone with a mental health problem is necessarily more creative. And in fact, it's far more common that mental health problems will, will mean that people struggle more to deal with life. life more fulfilling. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. Mary Knight Patriarch Chedadai says the army alone protects Lebanon against its challenges, hailing its recent sacrifices that helped defeat the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. A fragile ceasefire around Gaza holds for a second day as Israel's relations with its U.S. ally shows new signs of strength, with tough talks looming in for a more lasting peace. And after eight years in office, Iraq's prime minister says he is stepping down, ending a political deadlock that has plunged his country into uncertainty. Those are your headlines for this Friday. Have a nice weekend, a nice holiday, and I'll see you again tomorrow for all the latest. Take care.